Good evening. This is the North Andover Board of Health meeting for Thursday, April 26. I call the meeting to order. Please stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so no public hearings. Why don't we do the approval of minutes? Um, Michelle and Joe, you read them over? Been read over, look good, critique by a number of people. Yeah. Okay. Can we make a motion to approve the minutes? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Minutes are approved. Now, the, we do have a change this evening under our communications, announcements, and discussions. Uh, the presentation on oral cancer had to have been a change. It's not going to be this evening. It was canceled. So uh, stay tuned. <clears throat> we will do something in the future, but uh, unfortunately tonight we're not able to do the presentation. And uh, so, but check, keep checking the... Uh, town website under news for future presentations because we have others scheduled, particularly for next month. We have uh, uh, vaping, we have uh, uh, scheduled, <clears throat> and we have a member of the state on the uh, 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 who deals with uh, tobacco coming in is going to talk to us. We have uh, uh, Dr. Frank McMillan. Dr. McMillan is going to discuss and give a, a presentation on addiction, uh, which is great because you can't talk enough about addiction. And addiction can be uh, opioids, it can be regular drugs, it can be psych uh, drugs that, uh, anything that uh, evolves the, involves the psyche. So any drug for uh, depression, any drug for any kind of cognitive disorders, you can still become uh, psychologically addicted to them. And uh, even some physical addiction too may not be like opioids. So it's going to be a great discussion uh, on addiction. <clears throat> So under new business uh, tonight, uh, Brian, why don't you read the new business? So new business? Yeah. <clears throat> so right now, I'd like to have the board take a vote on mosquito control. Uh, as it is now, when the mosquito control coalition does their testing, if we come back with any positive hits for uh, West Nile virus or Triple E, then the board can usually vote to do targeted spraying or other preventative measures to help alleviate the threat of disease. So I'd like to have the board vote to issue that power and authority to you as the chairman to act on behalf of the board. If there's a need in a hit or a spike in any type of uh, mosquito-borne diseases, just to streamline the process so we don't have to go through public notification uh, holding a meeting, taking the vote, and then getting the word out, and then getting the spraying in action. So if you delegate the authority to one member. If it happens, we can discuss it, discuss it with mosquito control, find out what the best course of action is, and then take that action right away. Okay, so if I did get a call from the Northeast Mosquito District uh, saying that we have a problem in town and we need a spray, yep. <clears throat> then I, I can uh, let everybody know I can authorize it on my own, Yep. And but I can make sure I understand and then make sure everyone else understands why we need the spray and, and what the, yep. really the emergency is. Exactly. Okay. And a lot goes into that with uh, working with mosquito control on the species of mosquito that it is, where it was found, the numbers they've been seeing of that specific species, and the season. So different species of mosquitoes peak at different times. Also different species of mosquitoes feed on different types of prey. So some only feed on mammals. Some feed on birds, some feed on people, and vice versa. So, and that's how the disease transmits from the bird population to the human population to other <laughs> reptiles, amphibians, things like that. So, depending on the species, the numbers they're seeing, where it is, and the season it is, all comes into play when they make their recommendations and we discuss it. So, you know, so far this year, <clears throat> it's been a strange, super cold in January warmed up in February, 
strange weather in March and kind of strange weather for April. And I mean, I know you're not an entomologist, <laughs> and I have very not a lot of knowledge of uh, the mosquito population. But you know, looking out the windows and getting out of your car, you see thousands of baby mosquitoes just hovering mm -hmm. above you. And I'm wondering yeah. if, and I don't know this answer. I'm wondering if the weather, uh, this the way the weather has been, if this is going to encourage a, a larger population of the uh, mosquitoes. I don't the, know. There's no direct answer to that because. Certain mosquitoes need certain types of habitat to breed and multiply. Other mosquitoes need a different type of habitat. So, for instance, one of the mosquitoes in the salt marshes, for example, um, will breed when it's flooded and lay their eggs, and the eggs don't hatch until the water recedes and the land becomes dry, then they hatch. So if it's flooded, that mosquito won't hatch and you won't get that species to become a nuisance or a threat of spreading disease. Other mosquitoes need the water, breed in the water, and they hatch in the water and then fly out of the water. So if that dries up, then that uh, mosquito species does not hatch. And the larvae stay in the mud, and the eggs stay in the mud until it floods again. So you have different mosquitoes requiring different types of habitat. So some mosquitoes may peak, while others are really low, depending yeah. on how much flooding, where the flooding is, and obviously the temperature comes into play as well. So there's no way to predict that. It all depends on which season it is, spring, early summer, midsummer, late summer, early fall, have different waves of different types of mosquitoes. So if we have intermittent rain once a week or every week and a half, we're yeah. going to have a, probably a higher population. Exactly. Because we're just feeding the population to breed and to uh, exactly. come out. So if it's really wet now, then it dries up. Yeah. Certain species won't actually hatch and they'll stay in their hibernative state until it floods again. So it depends on what happens going forward. You may have a really bad spring, but if it dries up and there's not a lot of rain in the early summer, then the populations may die down. And for those of us that have uh, vernal ponds on our property, that is a pond that, uh, that is there when it rains and disappears <laughs> when it doesn't rain, <laughs> watch out because this is going to be a rough and there are mosquitoes Season. that would utilize that habitat where it's flooded and then it dries up. And then when it dries up, all of the eggs will hatch and the larvae will come out and... And, and unlike lakes and ponds and streams and brooks and so forth, if you have, have a vernal pond, you don't have the fish, the amphibians, to eat these eggs, these mosquito eggs. Right. There are a lot of invertebrates and, it can be and insect larvae that feed on the mosquito larvae that go through the whole food chain. Yeah. So even river mosquitoes, if the rivers are flowing and full, the mosquitoes that are in their banks won't hatch because they'll just be washed away. They wait until it dries up and you have your mud type of uh, uh, habitat and then they'll come out of the mud. Yeah. So it depends on what kind of mosquito you have and where they are. Well, talking about the food chain, I haven't seen for the last bunch of years uh, that many bats because bats Eat mosquitoes. Eat mosquitoes. Yes, and I'm, I'm, I I don't know if that has if there's a correlation there, but uh, uh, years ago when I moved into North Andover, I used to see a lot of bats, you know, at dusk and so forth. Yeah. and uh, I don't see them anymore. Uh, not that much. These little brown bats uh, that hibernate in caves in Vermont and New York and elsewhere, um, they went to. Well, a number of years ago, they, they had a, a fungal attack that killed like 95%, and uh, they were disorientated. They were flying out in the winter time, uh, and the bats you know, around my property, particularly in my barn, they for all practical purposes disappeared. But there were a few of them last year, and I expected there were going to be a lot more this year. And I had a problem with them. I mean, they, in the nighttime, they just fly around eating mosquitoes. Well, that's the, right. that's the good part. Yep. So one interesting thing with mosquito larvae, um, a lot of people see uh, unused pools that are self-contained and holding a lot of water. Believe it or not, a lot of those don't have mosquito larvae because the other insect larvae eat all the mosquitoes out. Water striders, um, caddisfly larvae, other insects that are predatory will eat all the mosquitoes out of the pool and there'll be actually no mosquito larvae. So I've had mosquito control go out and actually take samples in like abandoned pools and things like that and they won't find any they've been completely cleaned out by the other larvae wow. that are trying to survive. Now, 
Uh, during the year, are we going to have the uh, Northeast Mosquito District come down for a short presentation? Or I would you, like to schedule that. You? Actually, okay. I've already um, <clears throat> thought about reaching out to them to see what their schedule was for later on this spring. I was thinking maybe the June meeting, but if um, Dr. Trowbridge can't, he couldn't be here tonight to do his presentation, so that may get pushed off until June. Yeah. yeah. So maybe July. Yeah. If you think that would be appropriate, that's, I can that's reach fine. out to it's, them. Uh, mosquitoes are good till mid-August. Uh, early yeah. September, rather, excuse me, mid-September, yeah. latest, once the weather starts to yeah. change, as you know, it's mm -hmm. it, it, the threat's over, pretty much. Right. <clears throat> but, uh, okay, no, that's going to be good. Um, then I make a motion for uh, our Chairman Live Pickler to act on behalf of the Board of Health to approve any mosquito spraying activities for 2018. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have in here. <clears throat> uh, why don't we go over the uh, uh, department reports, Brian? Okay. Uh, so this past month was a shortened month with uh, school vacation. So uh, some of the staff members took the uh, week off and had nice vacations. And now we're all back. But um, so for the past month uh, for meetings, we did a regional, uh, which is our 3B uh, public health coalition, met with an EDS subcontractor who is going to be helping us to revamp our emergency dispensing site plans. This has been in the works for a while since we did a drill uh, last October, which was basically our annual flu clinic that we set up with the high school. We used that as a... Um, tabletop drill and a functional exercise. So we planned it out ahead of time. And then when the day of the clinic came around, we used that to basically practice setting up uh, an emergency dispensing site with uh, staff, volunteers, and timing and things like that. So we kind of mapped everything out, went through the exercise, and then had to document all of our findings and if we had any gaps, uh, questions that we kind of uh, maybe arose during the functional exercise and met with a contractor uh, a couple weeks ago. She's going to be reviewing our old EDS plans and taking into account the gap analysis that we kind of performed and helping us create a new, uh, more proficient uh, emergency dispensing site plan for any type of mass vaccination clinic or dispensing medications, things like that. So that was one uh, very productive meeting and um, little working group that we had going on. So that was one of the things we did this month. We did have our just our regular regional uh, public health coalition meeting where we are discussing the next round of fiscal funding uh, for the next fiscal year starting in July. Um, the public health coalition in this region was for the most part level funded. We did take a little bit of a hit in some of the operating costs that we usually get from the state, but it was minimal um, and can definitely be absorbed. Uh, did one regional opioid meeting with uh, MVP ASAP, which is obviously a very long acronym. And that's the board of the directors met a couple weeks ago, and we are working on a little reorganization of the entire working group. I know some of the original board of directors are stepping down and moving on. They're retiring and kind of moving away, so they won't be able to be involved anymore. Um, met with the rec department on our uh, running program called Youth on Track. That is going to be our first annual uh, running series starting uh, the end of uh, May. It's going to be actually, the, I think the mid-May, it starts at May 16th, I believe. So it's a new program that we have that uh, Caroline and I worked on and presented to the rec department. We have about 50 members, kids, signed up for the new program. We're going to be running around Reynolds Field and um, learning about exercise and physical fitness. Um, they're going to be timed on quarter miles, and they're going to do it every week and try to improve on their scores. We have uh, the rec department getting us volunteers from like the track team and uh, high school students to help out with teaching the kids how to stretch and proper form for running. Um, we're also going to have a table of literature for uh, nutrition at the site as well, and that's a uh, six-week course. So it'll be once every week for six weeks, and we're really looking forward to that. And hopefully it uh, really takes off 
and we can do a fall series as well. And every year we'll do a spring and fall youth on track running series. So we did a site visit around the track. We were going to do it at Reynolds Field, kind of mapped it out, took some measurements. I'm going to do some more, some official measurements with the DPW and get an exact uh, foot, like number of feet, so we can do a uh, quarter mile and half a mile. Uh, I also met with uh, Dairy Queen reps. We're going to be opening up a potential Dairy Queen over at Quick Pick. Great. Yep. Um, and we also had a... What was that? <laughs> is, it, is it just for the summer that they're opening? No. Or is it well, they haven't built it yet, so it's just in the plan review stage right now. They just got the application, and I've met with them about what they would be required to submit. Yeah, but will they be open just during the summertime, or is it year-round? Probably no? year-round. Yeah. It's going to be inside. So with uh, Quick uh -huh. Pick and uh, the new barbershop restorations over there, and obviously you get the pizza shop and everything, so probably year-round. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Well, another place for some of us to go to. Yes. <laughs> That's why I asked if they yeah. could be open year round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need business. Uh, well, a lot of students go there after school every day. So they definitely have a market and uh, a clientele and close walking distance. So that's really good. Um, we did actually have a meeting on getting all the running program supplies together. So we're going to be um, getting some, some tents, some tables, t shirts, the medals, uh, the bibs with the numbers on them. Um, cones and all that stuff all set up so that's uh well in the works right now we did do one training uh it was an all-day training in uh down in fort devons is the department of public health community sanitation seminar which they hold annually and this year was big in terms of recreational camps because they just redid the regulations for the first time in like 30 years so um they just came into effect they're brand new there's a lot of changes a lot of updates um we will be having a camp come in applying for a variance at the next meeting. Um, one of the new regulations in the uh, camp regs is uh, staff counselors have to be on board any transportation buses that go to and from site at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, which causes a problem for one of the camps that does that because they have a contracted bus company come pick up a bunch of campers and then brings them all home and then goes back to their base of operations. The regs now mandate there's a staff member from the camp on that bus. Well, that's going to pose problems. So the bus company would then have to <clears throat> go back to the camp to drop the camp counselor off after he does his route, which they didn't budget for staff time, and they already had the contract signed with the bus company. And all the funding's been determined. All the prices for the camps have been determined, so this would really put a hardship on them. So they're going to be applying for a variance at, that, at the next meeting. Which, what, what was the purpose of having a counselor uh, stay on the bus till the last person is dropped off, and then was it additional supervision? Additional supervision, and it's not necessarily for that they have to stay on the bus and then get dropped off. It just that's how it works out. The regs mandate there's a counselor on the bus whenever it's off site with the campers on there, but the way it would work with the end of the day drop off or beginning of the day pickup, but there has to be a, a counselor on the bus when they pick the kids up, and then at the end of the day when they drop all the kids off. So to do that, the bus would have to go to the camp, pick up the counselor, go pick up all the kids, drop all the kids off at camp, then at the end of the day, pick all the kids up with the counselor, drop them all off, and then drive back to the camp and drop the counselor off. So it's two legs on, one leg on each end of the trip, yeah, and they have to go back to the camp. Wow. So next year it will be incorporated into their procedures their staffing time and their transportation budget. Do we need to update our regs in any? You said all new regs came down for the state regs, but do we need to? We don't have any local regs for camps. We just use the state regs, use state which regs are okay. very, very thorough okay. and extremely comprehensive. So to go above and beyond what they already have, I think, is unnecessary okay. because they are pretty ironclad at this point to so say we just redone. They were really comprehensive to begin with. Then they just went through their whole revision. So, All right, good. So that was a great training. <clears throat> and then um, just throughout the month, the regular septic inspections, housing inspections, your normal trash complaints, and general complaints. <clears throat> Talking about uh, septic, um, <clears throat> uh, you and your staff wrote a wonderful write-up. Oh, thank in you. The uh, quarterly newsletter yep. that went out 
in the mail to town residents. Yes. It was spot on what you said about septic and what mm -hmm. to look for and so forth. Yep. And I didn't know if you wanted to uh, expand on that for a couple minutes uh, as sure. far as uh, do's and don'ts. Because yep. I think, <clears throat> you know, one thing about all these boards, like I'll just talk with the Board of Health, of course, but repetition is good. Uh, we may have a, a whatever we have a, a talk on, like on might be in cardiac or mm -hmm. water or mosquitoes, and we have an entomologist in. We want to do it more often than once every so many years. Yeah. Some of the uh, uh, programs that we introduce, we may want to talk about yearly, bring it up in a, a different way, have the same speaker come, and because not everybody watches. So in this case, repetition is good. Yeah. Excuse definitely. me for what we do. So, all right, essentially, what people need to know about septic systems, and we get a lot of calls coming in from residents that just move in from the city or from out of town that have never had a septic system before. They move into our country and they're on septic, and they don't even know what it is. Most people think that your septic system is just a tank that's out in the yard. That is only one minor component of your entire system. So what a septic system is, is it's a, a system, it's a series of components that take all of the wastewater from your house, they put it into your septic tank and it settles. And you have your solids and you have your oils and grease that float that basically get separated in this tank. Because what happens is the middle layer of just the, call it the gray water or black water, comes out of the tank right up by the top but below where all of the things float. So whatever's floating, your grease, your oils, your hair, stays on top. Everything that's solid goes down to the bottom and bacteria and microbes process this and they eat it and digest it, create septic acids and things like that. But it, what it does, it breaks it down to its uh, chemical components basically. And the effluent black water goes out of the middle of the tank up towards the top but below that top layer goes to a box. Oh, okay, so it's not like, I'll say the water. The yes. water rises to the very top and then drains out into the leachate field, it there's a, there's goes a out baffle, below there's, the top. There's a baffle there. Okay. Correct. There's a T and there's a baffle inside the tank that keeps the top layer from going out of the tank. Okay, that's why it doesn't, it doesn't go down to the bottom layer, okay. but just takes out the middle portion of the tank and takes that water that all of the solids have been taken out, floating or sinking, so you just have pure liquid at this point. That goes into what's called the distribution box, where it's a smaller box, but that's where all the different pipes come out of. Okay. So one pipe goes in, and say two to four to five to six pipes can leave this little distribution box where it distributes all of your effluent out into your leaching field. Your leaching field is the most expensive part of your septic system. It's the biggest and has the most material. And what that material is, it's your pipes, and then below your pipes is a uh, crushed stone, and below the crushed stone is um, several feet of, it's called septic sand. It's a coarse sand that the effluent drains through at a slower pace, but fast enough where it actually goes through, and all the microbes in that layer of sand digest all of the other chemical components in that effluent. So it goes out through those pipes into the rock. It perks through the rock, where it is also in case with bacteria and microbes that eat all of the effluent and then into the sand where more microbes and you have your aerobic bacteria which start at the top where all the rock is <coughs> gets down into the sand layer and that changes to an anaerobic bacteria so air for the top row of bacteria and then no air for the bottom row of bacteria and they eat different things so by the time it gets through the aerobic bacteria and anaerobic bacteria, you have essentially drinking water at the bottom, believe it or not. And that's the whole purpose of a septic system is to filter all the water coming out of your house, separate it, digest it, process it, and discharge it back into the aquifers. It's also very important that uh, septic systems properly operated, maintained, and pumped on a regular basis. Correct. Could be every year or two, depending upon how many people live in the home. Uh, because if it's not, then that sludge, that grease, eventually will make its way 
all the way to the leach leachate field. And that's where the problem is. That's the Correct. most expensive, as you said. Yep. And it plugs up. Basically what right. you have is you have these tubes with numerous holes in them. Yep. And if you have any of that oil, grease, or sludge from the bottom make its way there, kiss your le leachate system goodbye and it's going to cost megabucks to right. fix. Right. Because the, the truckloads of crushed stone and truckloads of crushed sand below your leach field is very expensive. Um, so what happens is if people don't maintain their system, and I say maintaining, it's almost like a car. If you have a car and you change the oil every 2,000 miles or 5,000 miles, it's going to run for a long time. Same thing with pumping your septic tank because that layer up top of the grease and the oils and that sludge layer down bottom of the solids that take a long time to break down, if those make it out of that pipe in the middle, it's over. Then you're going to have problems, and that's when people get things backing up into their house, yeah. because the the septic pipes and the stone get clogged up with all of the solids and the grease and the oils and the hair, and that doesn't get broken down by the microbes and the bacteria. So it plugs up your system, and the water's got nowhere to go. So it goes up into your yard, and you get the ponding, or it goes back into your house and into your basement, which is definitely not good. Now, can those pipes be uh, like you can? You know, the plumber can run a snake through your line in your house. Can those pipes be, have uh, be No. Because those pipes have holes in the bottom. Yeah. And those holes is where all the effluent goes out into the crushed stone and sand. It's the crushed stone okay. that gets all plugged up. The only way to um, fix it is to remove all of the stone and sand and replace it all, which is tens of thousands of dollars. Excavation and materials is not cheap. So by maintaining your system, you mean pump it. So when they pump out your system, they pump everything out, and your septic tank is pretty much bone dry at that point. And then it fills back up, and you have your separation of layers again. And those layers take years to build up on top and up bottom. So every two years, you should pump it out, cleans out your tank, and then keeps the correct stuff going out into your leach field. What about every year? Not necessary unless you have a really big family and a lot of water usage because those tanks are big and that, those layers take a long time to build up. So it's recommended every two years would be appropriate. If you have an older system and you want to be extra cautious, you know, like an antique car, and you want to change the oil every thousand miles, by all means feel free. It's not necessary, but to be precautionary and to really baby it, that might be something that you could look into. How deep are the uh, pipes when they go out? You know, you, you, you know, like, I know where my septic cover is because I haven't mm -hmm. pumped. So how deep below the grass are the, is the leachate field? The grass should be probably, you should be about maybe a foot down. A foot down. Because you have on top of the pipes and the crust stone, you have pea stone, which is very, very small crust rock on top. And then on top of the pea stone is your loam and your grass. Okay. So that could be <laughs> nine inches of loam, four inches of pea stone, and then your grass. Because I, I, I mentioned that and I ask because it's important that people realize that you don't drive cars or heavy equipment. <laughs> That's why I asked you because yes, I wanted everyone yeah. to hear it. Over the leachate field because you could destroy you, the you, whole thing. You can crush the pipes. Right. They're just plastic pipes. Granted, we mandate Schedule 40, which is a thicker PVC pipe, which can handle some weight, maybe a car. But I definitely wouldn't drive a big truck over it or heavy machinery. Definitely not. That can, once you crush your pipes, then you block them off where they get crushed. So if you have a 50-foot-long trench as part of your septic system leach field and you crush it off halfway, you've just removed half of your um, field where that would absorb all of the effluent. So you cut your system life probably in half, maybe even worse. I ask these questions because I want people on the yeah. other side of this table to hear them too. Yeah. Sometimes people will leave their faucet running by mistake, or their toilet will run and the stopper just won't shut, you know, that is a very stop good everything point. off. So it runs and it runs, and at what point does can it affect your septic system where it'll start to, it can't handle any more fluid going out? If you have a leaky toilet or a leaky faucet and you have a septic system, you should fix it immediately. 
Septic systems are designed to um, accept so many gallons per day and one leaky faucet and then your showers, your dishwasher, your cooking, your cleaning and the leaky faucet can tax that and go beyond that designed flow per day and what that does, that will completely flood out your leaching field and it will have nowhere to go but back into your house. So once that happens, all of the uh, effluent and all of the sludge down bottom and the hair and the grease and the oils, there's so much water going in, some of that gets washed out into your leaching field and that can help destroy your leaching field. Another thing that is very important to know is um, garbage grinders. Very, very convenient, but if you're on a septic system, that will destroy your system. The bacteria and the microbes in your septic tank and leaching field aren't designed to, um, not the type of bacteria that can digest food waste, vegetable materials, shells, anything like that, um, plant skins. Now, I've seen them advertise where they say a septic approved or you know the garbage disposals and made for septic systems or oh no I don't no. know what what it means when I when I read that on the box but no those particles don't get digested and they will clog your leaching field and destroy your system now you can design your septic system to accommodate a garbage grinder but basically what they do is they just double the size of your field to last the same amount of time so you spend all that money to put in a garbage disposal double the size of your field, you spend a lot of money doing that. And then it lasts the same amount of time as if you had a regular field and no garbage disposal. Okay. So now everybody out, everybody watching, hopefully there's more than two people, Three. are thinking, oh boy, now I have to be really careful with the water output in my house because I could possibly flood my system. Uh-oh, I better not shower for a month. <laughs> so <laughs> an example of gallons per day so people understand. Just a typical example of uh, family of two, family of three, like what will a system usually accommodate that's in good working order that would pass Title V? Systems can be designed for three bedrooms plus. Okay. And what that means is per bedroom in the house, and it's not necessarily just a bedroom, but it's the number of, total number of rooms in your house. Um, if you have, say, a three bedroom system, that system can accept 330 gallons per day. That, that's a pretty good amount of water. That's a lot of water. Four bedrooms are designed for 440 gallons per day. Five bedrooms, 550. Six bedrooms, 660. And that's your typical range. Um, an average family may only use two to 300 gallons on a high usage day. A busy, yeah, okay. Correct. But if, <laughs> if you have guests coming in from out of town, a few holidays, things like that, people can go up to that limit, and that's what it's designed for. Well, I would just send them to my neighbor's house to shower, that's all. <laughs> if you have good neighbors, then yeah, by all means. If you're building a home, yep. so I want to build a home, and I want to build a four-bedroom home, but <clears throat> I want to be really proactive, and I wanna, I'm going to live here for 40 years and so forth. Do you build a home with a larger system? So I have four bedrooms. Do I want to put a five-bedroom or a six-bedroom uh, uh, a system in? for future growth or to really make sure that I just, I don't want any problems with my septic system? If you are looking to add on to your house, then yes. Um, if you're not looking to add on to your house, then no. If you have a four bedroom house, and you have a four bedroom system. So I'm in the planning stage of designing my home. You're perfectly fine. Okay. If you want to add on to your house and add, finish the attic, add on a big great room above the garage, a massive bedroom, first floor suite somewhere, off the back, then that gets tricky. If you know you're gonna do it, then plan for it accordingly because we have a lot of people coming in to us now that are, they just bought a house, they move in, it's on septic, and they wanna add an addition on. The septic isn't sized for it. It's sized for what the house is then and now. Okay. And by adding on additional rooms, additional living space, new footprint, additional square footage, can bump you up to that next call it, you know, the, the, the next design phase of four bedrooms to five bedrooms. If that happens, you have to redo your leaching field or add a trench on to that leaching field, which can get costly. So some people come in, they're going to be finishing their attic, making a, a master suite or a college suite, 
for somebody coming back home and their system isn't big enough to accommodate the additional living space. So they have to add on additional trends. It could be eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Wow. Because uh, we've had uh, uh, septic installers and engineers come before us where they plan for a larger system. Yep. Um, not recently, but uh, I've, I've had it over the years many mm -hmm. times. And uh, out of future future possible expansion right. of the home. Yep. Okay. And Brian mentioned uh, uh, leaks, faucets, and so forth, have them repaired. Uh, there are exceptions. This past uh, winter, for example, we had uh, some really rough days, extremely cold nights. And what I did, I mean, my house is built in 1688. It is insulated, getting more insulated all the time, but it's still very, very old. And so what I did is I had the hot, cold water faucets mm -hmm. running, just dripping all night long and prevented the lines from freezing. I'm absolutely convinced, based upon some very unpleasant experience, that if I didn't do that, they would have froze, if they had in the past. And that's the lesser of two evils yes. at that point. So that's, that's your own choice as a homeowner. If you have a house and you have a leaky faucet, I would recommend fixing it. If you have a toilet flapper valve that is not quite sealed properly and the toilet runs all the time, that's going to cause you definitely problems down the but road. If you're concerned about any freezing during the winter, just let it drip. It's right. Fine. Keep the water moving a little bit. Yeah. You don't need a steady stream. Just let it drip. Right. During the night, it'll be, it'll be fine. Yep. A couple of years ago, I did that all night and woke up the next morning. I took a picture of the temperature. It was minus 11 degrees. And it warmed up a little bit during the day. And I said, well, this is fine. I turned it off. And a couple of hours later, it had frozen again. I had frozen. Yeah. Period. So I said, geez. So fortunately, I put the heater in the crawl space and so forth, and I was able to, to uh, unfreeze it. But it's just, it could be a nightmare. Well, not everybody has a house built in 1688. Yeah. <laughs> you were, you built it new then, didn't you, Joe? I was 20 years old at that time. Okay. All right, that's good so, on yeah. the subject. All right. Uh, one other thing I want to mention tonight was the farmer's market. We are um, starting to receive applications for the food vendors that will be doing the farmer's market, which is uh, starting this June, I think the end of June, if I'm not mistaken into uh, it goes 17 weeks this year. So there was a, there was a huge turnout last year. Uh, people loved it. It's coming back again. They are expanding it this year as well, and they're adding the artisan market as well, which will be down off of High Street. So there'll be crafts and things mm -hmm. like that off of High Street on Sundays, and the food vendors and the other vendors where the original farmer's market was. So they're expanding it this year. Wonderful. So um, I know we had talked about what to do with the fees this year. I know last year we had waived all the fees just to see how it went and get them up and running. They attracted the vendors in. It was a huge success. I had spoken with um, Phil to call the regarding the fees again this year, and I think we decided that it would definitely be appropriate for the vendors to pay their temporary permit fee. Um, you know it's going to be successful. It was a great year last year. We anticipate it's going to be the same this year. It's worth them to pay the $35 fee which pays for our staff time, our materials, and our weekend inspections. We will do a series of inspections throughout the course of the summer. Um, obviously, the first day is the most important, getting everybody up and running with the way that we need them to be. Minor education comes into play sometimes with some of the out-of-state vendors coming in. Um, once you get that taken care of, then there's a few spot checks throughout the course of the summer. So just to cover our consultant time, staff time, and materials, I think the, the board should um, not have to wear the fees this year, and Phil agrees with me. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And there's parity in town for all the other events that are going on. That's Yes. And, you know, the first year, brand new, let's track and, yep. uh, what we can. And, in fact, Joe recommended that last year to waive the fee, and it was a good idea. Yeah. And definitely. it attracted a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we still have our costs involved in, in, uh, in, in regulating and maintaining what they do. Yes. So and we didn't charge them last year, but we still did the inspections and right. all that. But it was excess. I think um, this year, $35 temporary permit fee for the entire farmer's market is a fantastic deal for them. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so shots. what's that, Joe? One other one, I don't see it here, uh, I am in the uh, senior center. Immunizations, um, pneumonia vaccine clinic, Monday, May 7th, 9 to 2.
is on Caroline's uh, monthly report. Okay. Well, that's good. So, and then the shingles, some commercial plans are uh, health care plans are now covering. She's going to continue to follow that up and find out which ones uh, cover the, the shots and look to do a shingles clinic as well. So, definitely some movement there and we're looking forward to it. Okay. All right, so that, uh, just looking over the RN report, it's, there's, Caroline's not here, but, uh, we did have, just previously, last month, we did have the uh, health fair at the senior center with cholesterol screenings. Um, uh, it, yes. it was very successful. Yep. I, it was great. I think it was a rainy day, though. I think it was. Did it rain? It was great, though. No, it rained last year. Oh, this year was okay. Okay, I forgot. <laughs> but uh, no, it was very busy, and uh, you had uh, newer vendors, newer yes. uh, people there than I saw the previous yep. year, which was really good. Yeah, and they had the presenters, and I think it was a very well run, organized, uh, fantastic health fair. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it was great. So I'm, I'm glad we do that. Um, new Hep B vaccine, two dose series as opposed to three. Now that's something Caroline is dealing with. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right. And Michelle, septic. Um, how are how are the uh, inspections going uh, with Royal Crest? They hadn't appeared, but are things going? They as are. You hope? They're working with upper management yeah. on uh, classifying all of the violations that we had noted in the past yeah. and working on corrective action plans. So we've, uh, we've scaled back and we're not doing the comprehensive inspections of every single unit anymore. Upper management had met with the owners of the floor from Colorado and they sat down and they came up with a, a less intrusive and less comprehensive um, or uh, less staff time for us to get some of these things fixed and get the property back up to where it should be. So we're still working with them on timelines and prioritizing the things that we saw and extrapolating those violations throughout the entire site. Okay. Um, we still have uh, trash truck companies that aren't permitted? Probably. That would be my guess, yes. So I've the police are looking to add some staff time on there to enforce it. And I've spoken with um, one of the officers who does a lot of the enforcement, and he said he was going to be out there helping us get these things enforced. Why aren't they permitted? What, what's they, happening to, to, to delay their... They're not getting... Um, are they not sending the information into us for review? Correct. And, he, and they're out of town, we can call them, we can email them, we can send stuff to them. If they're not getting pulled over, that there's no reason for them to pay us money. Have things have changed then over the last couple of years? Uh, they were pretty good about it. The, uh, there's only a few that yeah. are out there that are smaller companies um, that don't come into town a lot. Therefore, they can slip through the cracks a little bit, yeah. but they need to get pulled over. And they're going to... I thought they were going to do, be doing more enforcements uh, last month, or have the police been doing... Uh, they have done some they enforcement, have done yes. Okay. And they okay. have pulled people over, but it's not their everyday routine. Yeah. yeah. So they can't dedicate a lot of time to it when they're short-staffed, too. Yeah, certainly. It's hard. So I, I like to encourage them. Get me a police car, a hat, and a <laughs> siren. I'll, I'll pull them all over. <laughs> yeah, that would be a sight. <laughs> Ah, uh, that's not right, and it's it's too bad. But you're right. The only way to uh, force the issue is to pull them over and ticket them. Right. You're right. We can't Brader, force them to pay. Wheeler Brader does a really good job with sending people to us yeah. that aren't permitted, and they catch a lot of them and send them our way. So some of these companies that only have one truck that comes to Wheeler Brader every other month, when they find them and they see them, they send them our way. Now, some of them, like I said, do slip through the cracks. There is a large company that I know that isn't permitted. Is there a reason for it? You know, I don't want to bring it up, but is it just, we don't usually sit back and just let the, and we're not, 
soft about it. So right. Why? Why, uh, why aren't they doing their due diligence and sending in their information or something? We can reach out to them again and see what we can do. Why don't I call? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Okay. I'll take care of it. So uh, none of their trucks are permitted? I'm not sure. Okay. Probably not. No, because their whole company would be if they got all of their okay. stickers. I'll call and take I'll take care of it. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. Um, I would hope that as time goes on, we uh, eliminate this regulation altogether. I mean, I haven't changed my mind since I've been a member of the, of the board here. Mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing like it anywhere else in the United States, to the best of my knowledge. We tell uh, trucks, private industry, uh, where to drive uh, through our town. Uh, a reason is because we can, and we had concern many years ago with these trash trucks. They're going through neighborhoods and so on and so forth, but there's nothing like it anywhere in the United States. If I'm wrong, I'd like someone to show me. Uh, the, the, the police have more important things to do. I'm surprised they spent any time on it at all, to be honest with you. I'd like to see this regulation disappear. Um, going forward, there's going to be further changes in our board. Maybe that would be the opportune time to do it. That's up to you. Well, this is. I don't know. This, I think, <laughs> I think this was part of uh, the entire process. It was happening. Issued. Is that there? There was uh, permitting and and uh, yes. maintenance of the roads. So that yep. would be kind of hard to do, since the whole. But the select one would have to be involved with this too. Yeah, it was part of the side assignment that was granted. Yeah, and I'll be glad to right. speak with them on this. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure it's an issue we need to bring up right now. No. So I <laughs> but just wanted to I would uh, recommend not going to say uh, express my continuous dismay mm -hmm. with this regulation. Yep. All right. Period. I would recommend not going up before the selectmen with this now. I have no intentions of going. Thank you. In front of me. <laughs> Thank you. Same sometime in the future, perhaps, but not now. Okay. Well, I think, uh, again, I am sorry we weren't able to do our presentation, but uh, please uh, look at the uh, news on our website. Uh, we have uh, next month, we have uh, two, two types of presentations coming vaping and uh, uh, addiction. And uh, is there anything anyone else would like to uh, bring up or go over uh, under um, uh, old business or any communications? I'm good. Okay. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion to adjourn is accepted.